open up the live stream right now. I'm just gonna let that finish setting up, let people come on in. Okay, here we go. We are up, we are live. Hello everyone and welcome to the live stream. This is Meryl with Akron Soul Train and tonight I am joined by resident artist Aaron Foster for a presentation all about wheat paste. Um, Aaron's exhibit, We Should Be Home, is currently up in Akron Soul Train's downtown Burton D. Morgan exhibition space and will be up until December 18th. Um, there is also a walkthrough of his show currently up on our Facebook page that you can check out. Um, it was a few weeks ago, so just kind of go in through our timeline. Our gallery hours are 11 to 4 p.m. Wednesday through Saturday. And you can come see Aaron's, um, some of Aaron's wheat pasted work in person. <laughs> Akron Soul Train is an artist residency program connecting and empowering the community and artists by granting fellowships that provide resources for all creative disciplines to foster a more vibrant Akron. On this Giving Tuesday, I really want to thank everyone for their support so that we can keep bringing art to Akron. I'd also like to thank our sponsors, the GAR Foundation, Akron Community Foundation, the Ohio Arts Council, the Leonard Family Foundation, Brennan Family Foundation, the Knight Foundation, the Char and Chuck Fowler Family Foundation, and the Corbin Foundation. Anyone viewing, please feel free to comment and ask questions below. Um, we will get to them towards the end of the program. And uh, also please comment on any of our videos, how you like this type of virtual programming so we can continue to produce the most thoughtful and creative content for you all. Okay, Aaron, I'm gonna throw it to you and you can introduce yourself and we can get started. Uh, hi everybody, uh, I am uh, Aaron Foster. I am a uh, Northeast Ohio based artist and educator, um, majorly concentrating in printmaking. Um, I have had the good fortune these past couple months to work with Akron Soul Train uh, and I put together an exhibition as sort of um, discussed uh, entitled, um, We Should Be Home. Um, I would really love it if people could make it out to see it. Um, I'm excited to talk to you this evening uh, a little bit about uh, wheat paste and, you know, maybe give you some ideas about how you could use wheat paste in your own practice. Okay. So I think on that, um, I've put together a little presentation. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, if you'll just give me a second, kind of bear with me. Um, hopefully you'll be able to hear me kind of talking through this, but um, I wanted to kind of um, you know, share some things uh, with you. And let me see, we'll play it from start. Um, hopefully everything looks good on your end. All right. So uh, when you think about wheat paste, wheat paste is uh, maybe not something you think about at all, but um, it's uh, something I'll advocate for. I think as an artist who often finds uh, himself working uh, within a specific budget or within certain limits. Um, wheat paste comes with some natural advantages for folks uh, working um, likewise. Um, you know, so wheat paste is, um, is kind of laid out here. It's an adhesive um, that's been around and been used for centuries in a variety of ways. And we'll look at some of those in a little bit. Um, but they generally come in, like I say here, two stripes. Um, one that's entirely reversible. And the other is not as reversible, depending on the conditions. Um, well, I think one of the chief advantages, or maybe a couple of the advantages that I would tick off to working with wheat paste, is that it's largely archival, uh, meaning it won't damage your work. It doesn't have an extra level of acidity to it. 
Um, it's non-toxic, which I think working as a printmaker is something that um, I've been focused on for a while now and increasingly focused on. Um, and I think it's something that, you know, works to all of our advantages. It's cost effective, uh, as you'll see here in a second, um, for probably pennies on the dollar. Um, you can make a pretty large volume of wheat paste that can be used um, for a good amount of time. And then it's relatively easy to use. I think that's one of its chief, chief advantages is that it's um, among the many things that we do as artists, um, one of the more forgiving in that um, it's quite flexible. Uh, and if you do make a mistake, it's easy to kind of back yourself up and, and fix that mistake. Oh, why are we not advancing? Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, so we gotta use space bar. All right. Um, real quick distinction I want to make because I introduced this idea a second ago in the last slide uh, about this kind of reversible, non-reversible situation. Wheat pastes, um, pastes made of uh, wheat uh, base uh, come in two, like I say, stripes. One is a flour uh, based uh, wheat paste, which is what's going to be demoed in this presentation. Um, and the other uh, is a starch based um, paste, which we're not going to get into um, this evening, but uh, it does have a lot of really excellent um, applications as well. Um, you know, the real difference there comes down to gluten. Um, gluten is uh, something, you know, that binds with the starches to make um, the adhesives more permanent. So the longer, um, you know, once you've made a flour-based wheat paste, if you've applied it to something, the longer it sits in sort of ideal conditions, actually the stronger it gets, which is, I think also, you know, could be seen as an advantage depending on how you're using it. Um, so thinking about the kind of, you know, the idea of wheat paste, if this is all coming to you kind of out of left field and without a lot of context, um, you know, it's something that you probably actually do have a lot of context for, but you haven't been acclimated to it, um, or maybe you don't think of it in, the, in that way. Um, but it's used for a variety of things. We're going to look at a few of them now, and I'm going to start with what I've kind of called artistic interventions, right? So these are um, uh, uses of wheat paste that have a kind of art, uh, maybe basis in them in the kind of, you know, uh, original context of that. And these examples are not work of my own. They're just ones that I sort of grabbed. Um, they're credited at the bottom, but I think they, they're good to illustrate, um, you know, some of the various uses you can kind of expect if you get into making this stuff, right? Um, so one of the first, I think, and probably oldest uses of wheat paste is actually within uh, folk art traditions. Um, it isn't explicit or specific just to Mexico, but I do think um, the Alabrijas pieces made uh, within that tradition are quite interesting and um, show, I think, or highlight probably some of the better uses of it in that respect. Um, but it's used a lot to make paper mache, right? And so if you've ever <laughs> been in or taught in or taken a class in a regular old kind of art classroom, you probably mucked in with it um, on this kind of layer or level at some point or other. But like all things, I think it has this kind of life of its own. And it's, you know, what uh, starts in the kind of kitchens of the folk finds its way into kind of uh, higher art worlds often and quickly. Um, and that's probably where you're most familiar with it now. So probably, um, you know, street art, graffiti, um, those sorts of things, paste bombing, I think sometimes it's called throw ups. I don't know. There's lots of different kind of um, terms for it, right? But um, you know, that was a kind of interesting, I think, transition, you know, place from folk art traditions um, and maybe broadsides to, you know, the kind of galleries and museums. And I think artists have really stepped up to embrace it, right? So um, some of the more iconic ones, right? You know, th thinking of like Swoon, who's been kind of generating really thoughtful, introspective, kind of beautiful pieces based on her community within, you know, New York, New York City, Brooklyn, Flatbush, those kind of areas for going on decades now, right? And this isn't only um, specific to Swoon, but I think it's good to illustrate um, some of the kind of more um, engaging uses of wheat paste. So in this instance, the illustrations are made, uh, you know, whether it's through a printmaking process or direct drawing, um, they're usually made on a thin 
er kind of stock, whatever that stock might be. We'll talk about papers a little bit um, down the bit, the road a bit here. And then they are applied to other surfaces, walls, you know, uh, pieces of wood, whatever, really. Um, that's one of the great things about working with wheat paste is it really extends um, the surfaces you can work on and with. Um, and, and, you know, it's really, again, kind of quite flexible. Um, Shepard Ferry, uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, his name has been bouncing around, I think, within art circles now for going on 20 years, at least, um, you, know, uh, you know, his Obey series was, you know, quite engaging and interesting. And I think, you know, those of us that didn't know him then probably connected to him with the Hope posters during the Obama campaign. Um, but, you know, again, here's an kind of, kind of iconic example of the use of wheat paste in that sort of context, right? Um, just, you know, sort of slathering up posters on the surface to make a point, to make a statement, to kind of share your vision, right? Um, another uh, name getting very kind of print-centric now, Dennis McNett, uh, you know, kind of goes by Wolfbat as the moniker. Um, works in and out of Brooklyn now, does these really powerful, really interesting, um, large format relief printed, often, uh, I shouldn't say explicitly, but often relief printed, you know, pieces that are then either collaged or, you know, montaged right into these larger, uh, like in this instance, um, wheat pasted installations or sculptural forms. Um, so again, you know, you're looking at um, a lot of really kind of interesting um, approaches to, you know, I've made these images and now how can I, you know, kind of bring a second, third, maybe even, you know, fourth life to some of this stuff. And, and I think this is a way to do this, right? And then Emmy Lingsheet uh, is an, a contemporary artist that may not be a, a commonplace name to people outside of the print community, but who's been doing really powerful work uh, in the last, you know, uh, well, for a long time now. Um, and this is an example of uh, a recent installation um, in Chicago um, that, you know, involved wheat pasting um, these sort of um, fungal forms along the wall and then using them as a sort of backdrop for other um, work and printed matter. So I think, you know, common themes emerge, right? So that it's really um, pro repetition, it's pro scale and volume. Um, it opens us up to a lot of, um, I think, real um, great possibilities, right? Um, and then it isn't constrained just to the kind of folk art world or the high art world. It's also sort of found very often in, in, in common usage in the kind of guerrilla advertising campaigns, right? So we've all been to a large metropolitan, you know, sort of space, whether it's Brooklyn, Chicago, New York, wherever, uh, and, you know, and we've seen these kind of, um, you know, you know, pastiches of like concert posters and advertisements for all sorts of stripes of things. And so you can see this a lot. Um, and again, there's maybe like this head scratch moment of how did they get that there? And it's a good chance that, you know, wheat paste was involved in some way, shape or form. So what is wheat paste or how do you make wheat paste, I think is the kind of big question to answer in this sort of talk. And so, um, and where do I connect to wheat paste? So, you know, in the recent installation that I, I did at Akron Soul Train, my show, um, this larger piece, uh, you know, directly beneath the Burton D. Morgan Foundation X sign, signage um, was wheat pasted in place, right? So, you know, in this instance, the imagery was developed through screen print, um, you know, sort of like a multi-layer screen print. And then it was kind of tessellated together um, to kind of create this sort of like wallpaper experience, right? And all of those pieces were wheat pasted in place and C2 kind of in the gallery space itself. Um, you know, and I think it's, it, it was time consuming, but it was also, I think, well worth it. And it, it kind of, you know, created a newer or different dynamic to some of the things that were existing in the space, maybe in frames and, and you know, et cetera and so forth. And the, and the solutions that I used here were really, really, really um, uh, DIY kind of infused and basic. Um, and I think that was intentional, but I think I want to share with you just some ways to kind of bring that into your own practice yourself if you're interested in that sort of thing. Um, you know, wheat paste is, is wonderful because like I said before, I think it's it can be, you know, quite um, cost effective. Now, 
I, I want to add a disclaimer, and that is that the recipe I provide here is one that I know has worked for me. Um, there's a lot of controversy and strong feelings over what the wheat paste recipe is. And I think if you gathered six people who work with this together in a room, um, you're probably going to get six different um, sets of advice. And I'd say listen to all of them and find the one that works for you. They're probably right, because if it's working for someone, then it works. Um, I'm pretty basic when it comes to this. I think it just, you know, flour and water to get the kind of base solution. And then if I'm concerned at all that the space that I'm putting these up in um, might be, you know, sort of prone to weather conditions or um, abrasion or, you know, people bumping up against it or, you know, whatever the case might be, I may add a few things to it to make it a little bit more sticky, give it a little bit more um, adhesive kind of qualities, those range, whether it's um, just sugar or cornstarch, but um, you, again, you're putting in, you know, kind of limited amounts of this stuff. Um, you're not putting in tons, right? Um, and then uh, I've found over the years that one of the disadvantages to wheat paste, um, you know, I, working at Akron Soul Train was one of the first times I'd worked at that scale. I'd worked with wheat paste on smaller projects and things, and so uh, I wasn't going through it at the volume that um, I was making it at. And one of the things I did find is that it, it turns quite quickly, right? Because it is a very basic recipe. And so um, it's not uncommon to have it, you know, go moldy or turn, you know, kind of bad on you. Um, one way I found or have found just through trial and error and looking it up online and talking to people, um, a little bit of uh, witch hazel, the sort of astringent that you use to clean your face, um, actually can help extend the life if the wheat paste is refrigerated for up to a week or two past what you would normally get out of it, which, you know, if you're making it in, in larger batches can be, you know, nice, right? Because you don't want to just dump it all down the drain. Um, how you make it is really, again, I think quite easy. Um, you know, the kind of key there is just balance ultimately, right? Um, you blend the water, get it nice and smooth, blend the water and flour, I should say, get it nice and smooth. You really do want to work out the lumps. So, you know, think about making those mashed potatoes, right? Like you want to get the lumps out of there. Um, you want to put it on the burner at a sort of medium heat initially, but you need to stir it constantly. And I think, you know, I spent a, a lot of years, uh, you know, uh, cooking and it reminds me a lot of making polenta, right? Like you just have to keep going or it's going to stick and it's going to burn. Um, once you start to get a sense that it's about to boil, you need to cut that heat down. Um, you don't want to let it actually come to a boil. Um, you can burn it and scald it to the bottom of the pan. And once it's on there, it's really difficult to get off. So, um, and then once you've got it at that low temperature and it's sort of simmering, you just um, continue that dance of stirring um, and checking its consistency. And what you want really is something in the neighborhood of vanilla pudding, right? I know that sounds maybe delicious and maybe gross to some of us, I'm not sure. But uh, either way, uh, it is about the consistency you want. And as you're stirring this, it, that length of time is important. Um, I've tried shortening that and gotten not great results. So really do let it cook that extra time, that 30 minutes. Um, as you're stirring, you're checking the consistency. If it looks like it's starting to get too thick, which it likely will, um, you dilute it with a little bit of water. Um, if it's getting too thin, um, not very likely. I've not had that happen much on my watch at all. Um, then you would add a little bit of flour and you just kind of keep bouncing back and forth until you've gotten it um, cooked, right, so to speak. Um, then you kind of, you, you do, you know, like, obviously you decant it into a secondary container. All kinds of containers can work. Um, obviously it's going to be hot. So you want something that's not going to melt immediately. Uh, and then I usually let it cool before adding any of those additives, right? So you add the sugars and those sorts of things while it's hot. I've found that they um, break down and they don't really do what they're designed to do. Whereas if I add them a little later, um, it helps. And that also is true of the witch hazel. Um, I add it sort of towards the end, right? So as you can see, um, kind of like this little array here on the, the kitchen top, um, it's all stuff you have in your kitchen, probably um, in all likelihood or can get from almost anywhere. I think total um, for the demonstration I did for, the, you know, here I, I spent maybe $4, right? So um, 
and I made a pretty large volume. And then I, I wanted to just show you uh, kind of rather than just tell you about the consistency you're looking for. Now it does thicken um, once you've made it, right? So when you put it in the second container, it does start to thicken up. It doesn't stay quite as loose as this, but this is about where I think you would want it to be, right? So that was always a challenge for me is like knowing, is it done, you know? And I think seeing it is often maybe helpful. Um, once you've made it and it's set up, um, you don't need to like wait any certain amount of time. I've found that you know, obviously you want to wait till it's cooled down. You don't want to burn yourself while you're doing this. Um, but uh, the tools and equipment and things that you need are pretty straightforward and direct. Um, you just need your paste, um, you know, squeegees of various types. You can sort of see here in my little slideshow. Um, the yellow type or the kind that you get to kind of like put Bondo onto your car if you've got you know, a hole or something. Uh, and then the others come with different things, but they work just as well. Um, I would say, you know, don't break the bank in terms of buying brushes or, you know, sort of those sorts of things, but buy ones that aren't going to shed hairs, right? It is an adhesive, it is thick, so it will grab a hold and you know, do some tension. So you want to pick something that's going to work. Um, as you've already seen, it's not, um, there's nothing in it to be worried about, but if you're concerned about getting sticky or you just don't like that feeling, um, a pair of gloves. And then I usually tote with me everywhere I go, a piece of Duralar or Mylar or something to kind of like work on top of. Um, I think it just helps. Um, in terms of the types of papers or things that you can wheat paste, um, I, you know, I think this really came into play um, with the larger piece at Akron Soul Train, um, but thinner papers. So the paper that I did the, the installation with was a little thicker and, you know, it taught me a thing or two about working with thicker papers and that it's possible, but it takes a different set of tricks than maybe if you're accustomed to working with thinner papers. I can attest to the fact that thin papers, things like Eastern papers, Kozos, uh, Mulberry papers, those sorts of things, generally work really well. Um, thicker papers, like I said, can work, but they um, offer a bit more resistance. Um, and ultra thin cheap papers, right? So like the kind you find in a photocopier, they can work. They do have a tendency to stretch um, and or potentially rip. So, you know, that's something to kind of always think about. And then the other bit of advice I guess I'd give is just, you know, always test your inks or make a test before you start um, installing anything, um, you know, laser jet printers or inkjet printers sometimes will bleed or run if you're making prints from those. So photocopiers often work better or the old school kind of, you know, fused toner bits uh, work better. Um, but most things will work. You just, you know, it's a bit of trial and error, but test it out first. Um, and then I did uh, include a little clip of me installing. I, so as a printmaker, um, for eons now, I, you know, have this kind of um, guilt relationship to what I do with not wanting to throw anything away because I make so much. And so I've made these like little cutouts and bits and pieces that I kind of carry around and entertain the idea of making collages with all the time. And I thought they'd be a perfect thing to kind of play around with here um, to sort of demonstrate, um, but to show you kind of like how quickly or easily now. This is sped up, so it doesn't go quite this quickly. But, um, you know, I just kind of carved out a space on, on my studio wall and, uh, and just began kind of installing these. And now the thing is, these are all done on pretty heavy paper, most of it like Arches cover stock or Reeves. And what I found in doing that is that it, you know, uh, what works best for me is to put a little bit of adhesive on the back of the piece, a little bit of adhesive on the wall get it stuck and then go over the front. And I think that's something that people are often hesitant to do, but um, I wanna reassure you that it dries very clear. It's not even seen. And it really is about absorption. That's really what gets it to stick. Um, the more of that glue that can kind of penetrate the paper and get through to the wall and make that adhesive kind of bond, um, you know, sort of the better, right? And so I think uh, I went maybe about halfway down this kind of spance before I finished. Um, and, you know, and I think it took me maybe 20 minutes to do, right? So it can go very fast and you can, you know, kind of cover um, a, a pretty decent amount of territory, right? And then what we can do is maybe uh, skip here towards the end. 
uh, and link. Oh, it's not going to want to do it. Well, um, we're going to keep going because nobody needs to watch all that. But um, I wanted to also sort of end here with, I mean, obviously I want to answer questions and do this, but you know, uh, going back to some of this reversible, non-reversible um, kind of conversation and, you know, the different uses, right? Um, so, you know, if you're really looking to kind of like stick something, right, it's not ever coming down. This isn't a temporary installation in a gallery space or something you're putting up out in public that needs to be stripped later. Um, you know, true wallpaper paste is a great, um, you know, kind of cost effective, low VOC kind of option. VOCs being those kind of, you know, volatile organic compounds that are in a lot of art supplies. And yes, uh, wallpaper paste has some, but you can get like the type I get here, this Romans uh, wallpaper paste is, um, it's actually a wheat based wallpaper paste itself. So it's not as bad as some. Um, nori, Yasumato's nor Nori or Yasutamo's Nori paste is another um, standard. It's actually what I used at the Akron Soul Train space for a good bit of it because it is um, quite reversible. Um, you just kind of dampen the thing that you've put up with it. Um, it isn't a true wheat paste. It's a different um, base, but uh, the concept is um, the same. The difference, I think, between these and, you know, the sort of DIY homebrew, of course, is cost, right? So for a small kind of quart size container of Nori, you're going to spend around $10. And if you're doing larger spaces, you can get, it can get kind of expensive, right? Pretty fast. Wallpaper paste is a little bit more economical, but again, it's not coming off. So if you're doing it in a gallery, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, and then uh, the smaller one here, the pure wheat starch. Now, uh, earlier on, I, say I made that distinction and it's a really important one. Um, all you book binders and folks out there that do that sort of thing, um, wheat starch um, is what you would find in most bookmaking studios as opposed probably to wheat paste in its true form. Um, wheat starch uh, is uh, reversible, archival. It's what they use in conservation. Um, you know, and so if you're doing those sorts of like little treatments like uh, end band covers or, you know, those sorts of things, um, that would be what you would use. And it's prepared in a similar fashion, but uh, not identical. So um, these are just some other things um, for your kind of gluey pleasures, I guess. Um, but yeah, so that's what I've got. I really appreciate you kind of listening and tuning in. Um, and I am more than glad to answer any questions. Okay, um, let's go ahead and take you off of screen share. Sorry. Right, I can kind of toggle in between a little easier. Yeah. So yeah, if you have any questions, um, feel free to type them out in the comments. Um, well, I ask my questions. <laughs> um, at the end, you kind of went over the different types of natural paste. Um, I worked with nori quite a bit, and that's made with seaweed, correct? Right. Yeah. yeah. And then there's yeah. also rice paste, too. There is. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and you can actually, I mean, you can make a rice paste. I, you probably know this because you've worked with it, but for those of people in the audience, um, if you go to specialty stores, you can find, well, it's actually becoming a lot easier to find, but you can find rice flour um, and make rice paste similar to what we were making or, you know, demonstrating here. So yeah, that's a good, good. And a lot of the advantages of these types of natural paste are just with working on paper, correct? Would, would you say that that's like a main advantage over working with like a PVA glue? Mm, yeah, right. So um, you know, I, I do love some PVA, right? Like I like, you know, I think it's a good, it's a good, it's a great glue, um, you know, but, um, it is, I think also, um, for those of us that I think rightfully worry about, you know, the things that our glues are made out of, right. Or the, you know, adhesives are made out of, um, you know, as you can kind of see, these are, or can be largely vegan, right. Um, they aren't um, harming things and we're not introducing new uh, plastics. So yeah, they are very natural, very kind of, um, or can be, I mean, you know, I think, um, and closer to organic, maybe not hundred percent depending on processing and stuff like that. But, yeah. And then 
Um, I guess a little bit more of a conceptual question. Um, going from the use of like an outdoor, almost guerrilla type setting, or now I guess in murals where it's a little bit, where it's more sanctioned to um, within the gallery, how do you think that's kind of like interrupting the quote unquote white cube of the gallery space? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. I mean, I guess, um, I think it's, I guess to me, I, I, it's, it's new enough to me, maybe not to all, that I feel like when I see it, um, it's, uh, it's bringing some of that kind of spirit or energy with it, right? You know, so I, I don't know, I know that sounds very sort of maybe um, loose or esoteric or what have you, but I guess my, my meaning behind that is that um, I do think about um, kind of the um, connotations, right, of all of the things that we bring with us into the gallery space. Uh, even the idea of a white wall is, um, you know, an entirely kind of like Western, you know, connotation, the way we hang things, right? We think about like, we take it for granted that each thing will be given its own demarcated, like, perfect, like pristine space and a frame um, and, you know, like, you know, six, you know, 60 inches on center and all these, you know, kind of things, these rules, these connotations that connect to, you know, a very Western tradition um, and a sort of Bauhaus kind of tradition still, right? But when you look at the literature, right, like galleries, museums, um, the standard before the 1940s and 50s really was non-white walls, right? Like it was like, you know, maroon burgundy right these were kind of like some kind of you know more standard things salon style hanging was much more common you know kind of there was a horror vacui kind of aesthetic of like you know we're just going to fill the the place from wall to wall right um and so the fact that we've lost some of that but that exists in other parts of the world uh is is really interesting to me and so i do think of it as disruptive in a in a kind of positive way in that even if it doesn't because it's also become very mainstream, right? Like it's not, we're not breaking really new terrain by doing these things. If you look around um, this kind of stuff, you know, looking at like Warhol's cows have been, you know, kind of hung in how many places now going back to the 1960s, right? Um, we're not breaking new, new ground, but we are at least acknowledging that we can maybe, you know, shift some of that headspace and shift some of that connotation and recognize that there are other ways. And then um, also because it's based, like basically for use with paper, it really does lend itself for like printmakers. Oh yeah. Print Do you see that um, changing or more people that aren't necessarily considering themselves actual printmakers and just artists that maybe use printmaking to do kind of more mixed media pieces, multimedia pieces. Um, I mean, I think that the, the uses, the possibilities are, are really like numerous. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, I think it, is, it does um, have an affinity you know, for paper, right? But like, if we think about the number of things that happen or pay on paper or can happen on paper now, um, you know, I mean, it has obvious, I think, or should have maybe obvious um, kind of benefit um, to lots of modalities, right? So like, I know um, one of my first interactions with it really um, was I, I was living in Raleigh, North Carolina, and they had this kind of um, contemporary art space downtown. And they brought um, people in for a residency who were doing like um, street portraits, right? And then they were quickly like printing these things out large format and wheat pasting them, you know, to the side of these buildings. And so, I mean, there you go. I mean, right. So this is, these people did not conceptualize themselves as printmakers. They were thinking of themselves as photographers who were kind of breathing new life into the kind of art craft of street photography, which is always kind of critically looked at, right? And, and so, 
Absolutely. And then, you know, I think of people who, you know, I, I work, I've had the good fortune for a while now to work on college campuses and, you know, it's sort of the, the kind of post no bills ethos, right. Of like, people are going to put things up and that could be with na stale, uh, staples. <laughs> I can talk and, or nails uh, and things like that, uh, push pins, but uh, you do find still, even to this day that there's still, um, uh, occasionally people who will go the extra and, and wheat paste, you know, whatever it is, I think anybody that has uh, an idea or a vision or a statement that they want to manifest on paper, um, this is a way to kind of get that out there. Right? So and it, it doesn't necessarily just have to be restrained to printy people. And then kind of going back to the idea of uh, using in like the cube of the gallery or something, it's also kind of breaking out of almost the edges of the paper like you showed us an example where you were using triangles and making a pattern or um with spoon like she's cutting out and collaging oh yeah so that's like as a printmaker as an artist a lot of times you're working on a rectangle or a square canvas or um like on in these fixed kind of parameters, but I think the idea of being able to we paste multiples or cut out shapes is is an exciting one. Yeah, it is. I I mean I think uh, you know I've talked about this before with folks, but um, you know for me I think too like for for a long while now at least for the last probably six or seven years um, I've been really increasingly like looking for as many ways as I can to um, get away from frames. And it's not just because frames are expensive, uh, which they are, but I think also like I, I came, I grew up in a place where, or in a, with, in a background that um, access to art, high art um, was really limited, right? Like it wasn't really kind of part of the infrastructure of my environment, right? You were more likely to find, um, I don't know, anything else, right? But like, um, you know, and I remember being a young person and going to my first kind of like portfolio review day with my, with my father and, um, and just recognizing that there was a real problem with um, invitation and accessibility, right? Like that there were people that didn't feel at home in those spaces. And part of it is that I think like really buttoned up kind of experience of an art space, right? Like it feels formal, it feels, um, you know, all of these things. And so I think there's something exciting about any of these strategies, right? Whether it's, you know, sort of um, paper that becomes sculpture, paper that becomes kind of something that straddles um, to, to worlds or is just sort of allows itself to be paper um, or, you know, is just glued directly to the wall. Um, it's, I guess, in some ways more to me, um, like tangible, right? Like I can touch it. I can, you know, it, um, it doesn't feel um, as if there's a barrier between me and it. And I think that that's kind of exciting. Definitely. Okay, well, once again, if you have any questions um, or comments, please put them in. I'm gonna do a quick check on the computer. Okay. Yeah, and even after the live stream, if you have any questions or comments, please put them in and I will try to relay them. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, this was great. Um, I'd like to thank Aaron for this awesome presentation. I hope you've all learned a lot. I know I have some new ideas. Um, I really loved the, the triangle pattern. Yeah. Uh, my mind went so many cool places that oh, so many cool things could be done with that. I love it. Um, once again, Aaron's exhibit, We Should Be Home will be on view at Akron Soul Train until December 18th. Also on view in our capsule gallery is Reshaping the Narrative, a show and film presented by the Akron Black Artists Guild, which is also up until December 18th. There is a walkthrough and artist talk currently up on Facebook and up on our YouTube. 
um, of that show. So you guys can check it out if you can't make it into the gallery. And once again, our gallery hours are Wednesday through Saturday from 11 to four. So we hope you can stop by. I'm gonna check one more time. Okay, so yeah. Thank you all so much for joining us and thank you, Erin, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.